Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kathy Neifeld with Agency One. We are scheduled to start at 12.02. We're expecting a large number of people to be dialing in, so I apologize for the delay, but if you will just bear with us and give us two minutes, and we will start the uh, webinar at that time. Thank you. Okay, uh, it is 12.02 and we're going to get started. Good afternoon, this is Kathy Neifeld with Agency One and it is Thursday, August 20th and I am pleased to present to you our good friends from John Hancock. Uh, our featured speaker today is Caroline Mackay, who is the Assistant Vice President and Council with Advanced Markets. And we also have joining us Wayne Baldwin, our good friend who's been our regional VP uh, with John Hancock for longer than I can remember. Uh, we went to Caroline about uh, a couple weeks ago and said, interest rates are so low. And this is really the time when gifting strategies are so important. Uh, is there a presentation that you can put together for us that can talk about uh, these opportunities and what advisors should be doing now to take advantage of these low interest rates. And then what happened? The AFR rates in September uh, for September were announced and they were the lowest in history. So Caroline said, this is the time to do a presentation because of, of this magnitude. And um, because we're coming into the last quarter of the year, and this is the time to take advantage of uh, phenomenal planning opportunities. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our uh, dear friend and colleague, Caroline, uh, who's going to talk for the next 45 minutes about planning opportunities. If you've got any questions, please type them into the question box and we will address them at the end of Caroline's presentation. So with that, uh, Caroline, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Really happy to be here. Um, it's sort of an understatement to say that these are very unusual and uncertain times, uh, but you know, to try to put a silver lining in terms of the planning options for clients, you know, this is really sort of an unprecedented time for some of our clients to do some really beneficial and significant estate planning. And that has a lot to do with the interest rate environment that we find ourselves in and the very high exemptions that are available to clients. Um, the reason that this conversation I think is so timely and so important to have now is that we are you know, on the precipice of a major election that could really change the landscape for uh, this type of significant planning, especially in terms of uh, the use of exemptions. So with that, I wanna just quickly cover some of the things that I wanna focus on today in our conversation and uh, take it from there. So first and foremost, I wanna just take a quick minute to go through the current estate planning exemption numbers that we use each and every day when we talk about opportunities for affluent and high net worth clients. Um, we're going to focus mostly on the federal level today in terms of federal, state, and gift tax. 
uh, certainly cognizant that there are many states in this uh, country that actually impose their own level of um, estate taxation or inheritance tax. Uh, so with that in mind, if you have clients who work in or live in those states, you know, you're going to want to be thinking not just the federal level, uh, but also about state opportunities. Um, then we're going to move into just generally conversation about how we use gifting in conjunction with life insurance planning. I think it's really important today to focus in on those opportunities of how we combine gifting opportunities with the purchase of life insurance or maintaining life insurance policies. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, gifting opportunities that create maximum flexibility for clients, because uh, I think in these very uncertain times, um, you know, one of the biggest hindrances for clients to move forward in planning is not because they don't have the wealth today to do the planning, and it's not that they don't see the opportunity that gifting or transferring assets out of their state presents. It's really about the what if. What if my circumstances change? What if I need that access to those assets in the future? You're telling me I'm gonna be gifting to, for example, an irrevocable trust that I have no rights to. What if, right? So we wanna be able to address those what ifs and take that objection off the table. And then finally, because of the low interest rate environment that we're in, because we don't know what's gonna happen in November, and even once we know what's gonna happen in November, we don't know exactly what any new tax legislation may or may not come out. So we want to be able to, again, add flexibility and also leverage low interest rates environment, which not only provides additional flexibility, uh, but also can create more efficiencies in funding large premiums. Um, and then finally, we'll talk just a little bit about how to engage clients. Who are the clients we should be talking to? What should we be talking to them about? What should the techniques that might be available to them are best suited uh, based on their asset uh, mixture. And then also, you know, what are the things that we can go out and illustrate? So with that, let's jump right on into the, uh, the, the current estate planning environment and looking at exemptions. So annual exclusion exemption or annual exclusion amount, that's the $15,000 a year that we can give to any individual. Um, if we're giving to a trust, we typically call those crummy gifts. And the good news about the annual exclusion gift is that they do not take away from our lifetime exemption. So I could theoretically today give away $11,580,000 plus $15,000 to a number of different people, eat up all my exemption, and then in years after, once I have no more exemption left, I can still do those $15,000 gifts each year to different individuals. So that that's a baseline that does get indexed for inflation, but it usually takes three to four years before we get up to the next uh, $1,000 uh, interval. So next will be $16,000. I apologize, my earbud wants to pop out a lot. <laughs> um, the basic exclusion amount, that BEA, that's the gift and estate tax unified exemption. So whatever we don't use during life, we have at death to protect our assets from the estate tax, which is 40% uh, of all amounts over the exemption. Um, remember that this exemption was changed back at the end of 2017, uh, made effective for 2018, and that's a $10 million base exemption that's indexed every year for inflation, which is how we get to the 11580. Uh, at the end of 2025, under the current tax law, that number is scheduled to reduce. So that $10 million base goes to a $5 million base, uh, which we predict based on current cost of um, um, living adjustments that we see, which create that indexing every year, would probably put us somewhere around just under six and a half million dollars if we did see that sunsetting happen, happening in 2026. Um, always good to keep in mind that especially working with clients who are doing intergenerational or generational planning, uh, that there is a separate tax that is imposed on certain transfers that either skip a generation or are provided to a trust that will benefit not only children, but grandchildren and potentially for future generations. Um, that generation skipping tax is also a 40% tax that is on top of the gift and estate tax. However, there is an exemption to help shelter uh, transfers from that tax, and that exemption is also 11580000 So it's tracking uh, along exactly with the gift and estate tax exemption. And then finally, uh, there's something called the deceased spouse unused exclusion amount. 
It's kind of a mouthful. I call it the SUI for short. And that is the exemption available to surviving spouses whose um, deceased spouse passed away without using up all of their exemption and under portability that now can be essentially taken over by the surviving spouse and used to provide additional shelter for um, gift and state tax transfers. So if you're working with widow or widowers, you wanna be conscientious of making sure that you're asking about whether or not there is any of this DSUI amount that should be factored into any planning advice that you might be given. Okay, with that, let's talk about the landscape and the opportunities or, or potential changes coming down the pipeline. So we know under the current law, we have a sunsetting of this uh, higher exemption at the end of 2025. But so much right now is obviously informed by what's gonna happen in November uh, and you know, come January of 2021. So if you uh, have a President Trump who wins re-election, um, you know, his, his uh, point of view or what he would like is to see that all of the provisions of the tax bill that got passed at the end of 2017 uh, would be made permanent. So the gift and estate tax rules or the changes were not made permanent uh, as to that prior bill. So he would certainly be seeking some sort of extension or continuation of this beyond 2025, although he may not be successful, successful given uh, the current deficits and the spending going on. Uh, if you see a President Biden get into the White House, uh, you are likely to see some sort of tax legislation that would roll back this 2017 tax package sooner than 2025. Uh, it's been thrown out with respect to the gift and the state tax exemption that we may see the exemption not only sunset early, but even be lowered to about a three and a half million dollar exemption is what's been thrown out. Um, could see increases in the estate tax, highest estate tax rate. Right now we're at 40%, we could see it go higher. And then there's been some conversation about maybe looking into uh, step up in basis. Uh, I haven't seen as much discussion there, but it's worth pointing out. So with all that uncertainty, you know, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen in either case, no matter who wins, we can't expect or predict exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and that puts us all and our clients in a position of, you know, scratching their head, trying to guess uh, about the type of planning they're doing. And that's where I think flexibility uh, comes into this. And you'll hear me use that word over and over today because I think it's an important word. And one, again, that helps our clients move forward with doing the type of planning that we think, you know, is recommended uh, for their long-term success. So let's talk a little bit about outright gifting uh, and why, you know, that makes a lot of sense and how we combine that with life insurance. So gifting opportunities with life insurance, you know, there's the standard client owns a life insurance policy or transfers a life insurance policy into a trust, and then they're writing the premium check, which usually takes some of their annual exclusions down. You know, they're doing those crummy powers. And to the extent they have larger premiums that can't be sheltered by annual exclusion gifts, they're, um, they're documenting uh, those additional transfers on their gift tax returns, just writing checks. Then we have a lot of clients who are taking the opportunity to not only just provide assets into the trust that can help fund the life insurance, but really think about more long-term estate freezes and getting appreciation out of their estate. So in that case, you may be looking at transferring an asset itself, uh, particularly a highly appreciating asset that maybe has income being generated off of it and transferring that to a trust to not only remove the value of the asset and the appreciation out of the estate, but then also have that source of income to help cover premiums so that the client doesn't have to continually be writing checks to pay those premiums. Um, certainly, I mentioned in the beginning, you know, I was seeing a lot of clients, you'd be surprised with the number of very high net worth clients that I see on a regular basis that have maybe one, at least one policy that they bought so long ago, maybe before they had an estate tax problem, uh, and they still own that policy in their estate. And that's a that's an easy one. Like, we, we want that not in the estate. Unless there's a reason that it's being held inside the estate, we want that out. So that would be an opportunity to use some gifting to go ahead and get those life insurance policies out of the personal estate. And then, you know, when we're combining low interest rate environment and more technical planning, we may see clients doing um, sales of assets to a defective trust that requires seed gifts. So we could use the seed gift uh, and use up some of our gifting exemption for that seed gift 
to then do the asset transfer or sale. And then again, use the income generated off the assets that have been sold to the trust to help fund the insurance needs. So a lot of creative ways to fund and get money into the trust to pay premiums. If you have clients who um, previously engaged in maybe split dollar, particularly, you know, I always look for survivorship policies that were done under um, the economic benefit regime. So they've been using those, they used to be called PS38 rates, but those joint life rates, which are very, very low for survivorship. Um, if you have clients who have that and they're now in their 70s or maybe 80s, and both insurers are still alive, you know, I would definitely be looking at opportunities to try to roll out of those split dollar deals and maybe use gifting to help do that. Uh, because we know when you have the death of the first spouse, there's a significant uptick in the cost, the economic benefit cost of carrying that split dollar to the death of the second. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to, to start making some recommendations to clients now. And I've been involved in a number of cases where it was actually opportunities to replace a policy for a better policy um, that was a little bit more efficient or would um, last longer than under current illustrations, the existing policy. Uh, also use opportunities for exiting maybe other types of financing arrangements, maybe a premium financing arrangement. Client now has liquidity, could pay that off, use you know the large amount of gifting they have to get out of those deals. And then if, um, People have done previous transfers that weren't fully protected from the GST because they had limited exemption at the time they did transfers. You can actually retroactively apply GST exemption, like exemption I have today. I can apply it to, to transfers I made later to now create fully exempt GST trust. So those are a couple of different opportunities of how we can use current gifting exemptions to benefit or use in conjunction with life insurance planning. I want to talk quickly about sort of why this is a really good time, especially with certain assets, to be doing gifting. Now, if you've done asset transfers before, gifting of assets or even sales of assets to defective trust, um, you might be aware of the ability to discount, let's say, a business interest. So I own an LLC and I'm going to sell or transfer, let's say, a 40% interest in the LLC to my trust. Typically, we can get some really good discounting on the value of that asset uh, because of something called lack of control. So the assets that I've transferred to the trust, the trustee does not control the asset because they own a minority interest. And also something called lack of marketability, which is in closely held, oftentimes family businesses, it would be very hard to go out and sell to a truly third party, non-related party, uh, because most people don't want to be in business with a close entity of family members. So with that in mind, opportunity not only to do discounted gifts with those, but there are many businesses and business interests these days that are actually pretty heavily discounted because what's been going on in the marketplace and with coronavirus. Um, I know I was on a call not too long ago where it was a bunch of estate planning attorneys talking about the type of cases that they were getting. And one of them commented about how he had a number of auto dealership owners and how he was just beating down their doors and working with them to do some significant estate planning with those dealership interests because of the fact that those um, dealerships are heavily depressed in value right now based on the cash flow. So again, that's a huge opportunity right now is that you know we can kind of, again, bring a silver lining to the asset that might be discounted to benefit the family and the estate. Also, if you're thinking about certain stock portfolios or stock interests, you know, we have seen a rebound in the market, um, you know, over the last few weeks or a couple months, uh, but there are still going to be some depressed values out there. And without even having to go out and get an appraisable, appraisal or worry about lack of control or lack of marketability, you have some inherent discounting in the value of assets that could be transferred today, which means you can usually transfer more of the asset out of your state uh, because of that discounting. Uh, and what that does really is if we look at, you know, previous historic market recoveries, um, in particular after the last two market corrections in 2002 and 2008, you know, there's significant market returns that can follow these market corrections. And so if we can get an asset that has a depressed value today and with the, with the mindset or the opportunity that there could be significant market returns following uh, these corrections, then not only have we gotten more assets out of our state at less cost, 
but now we're moving all that good appreciation that comes from those recoveries outside the estate, inside the trust, uh, free of any future gift or estate taxes. So that's really the opportunity, I think, with thinking about outright gifting um, opportunities for, for many of our clients. Now let's just switch a little bit to that comment I made at the beginning, which is the what ifs, right? We can show clients what assets to transfer, how this benefits them. We can model out estate uh, tax projections and even income tax projections and say, we think that you ultimately will be better off by moving the asset from your estate and into trust. But then the what ifs come is, what if I need access? What if, you know, things, my circumstances change? I've had clients who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and still ask those questions. They never felt like they, they wanted to be fully protected. So this is where creating additional flexibility in the type of trust and the trust provisions we use really comes into play. So in this example, I'm talking about how uh, clients can use spousal lifetime access trust or SLAT to create that additional flexibility. So if you're not familiar with SLAT, essentially it's really just like an islet or an irrevocable trust that includes the spouse of the person who creates the trust, the grantor, includes the spouse as a beneficiary of that trust. Not just for the death benefit, which would be sort of the more traditional older school islets were really focused on what happens at the death of the grantor. This means that the spouse is a beneficiary while the grantor is still alive, which means that not only if I'm just buying a life insurance policy in this flat or this islet, um, but let's say I'm making a $11 million gift to this trust. So there's going to be other assets other than the life insurance policy. And I need access or I decide I want access to some cash flow to a particular asset. By having my husband as the beneficiary of that trust, um, if the trust is, is really drafted appropriately, we can get access. I can get access via my husband's interest in the trust. So it's not direct access. I don't have direct access to the trust, but I have indirect access and flexibility via my husband's interest. Now, again, the what if questions come up. What if my husband and I are no longer married? What if he passes away prior to me? I'm going to lose access to my trust. And this is where uh, doing two trusts, Husband does one for wife, in my example. Wife does one for husband. And now we, we split our exemptions or we split our funding so that it goes between two different trusts. And now there's a little bit more flexibility. So in this example, let's say I pass away, um, or I'm sorry, let's say my husband passes away. I've created a trust for his benefit and my kid's benefit. He passes away. I no longer have access to this top trust. And I don't know if you can see my, my cursor that I'm trying to circle up there. Um, I no longer have access to the stuff I put into that slat. Um, but what I do have access to now is the slat that he funded for my benefit. And hopefully we purchased some life insurance on his life. So at his death, the life insurance proceeds are funded in that slat. All the other assets he put into that slat are there. So effectively, I've replaced the assets I lost by not having and indirect access to my trust anymore with the assets now for my benefit with the trust he created for me. So that is one good way to think about using spousal access trust to again, overcome some objections about the what if. The second opportunity that I'm gonna point out today, uh, and we could go on for a while, but I know I'm limited in time, uh, is the survivorship standby trust. So this is an opportunity for a survivorship life insurance policy, um, in this opportunity, the older spouse or the sicker spouse typically owns the policy. And the benefit of that is it starts off as individual ownership. Um, so full access to cash value, uh, pay premiums directly to the carrier. You don't have to report crummy gifts. You don't have to make a large gift transfer to fund a trust. Um, it's just pure, simple individual ownership. But what you do is you have the spouse that, policy owner name um, a trust as the contingent owner and beneficiary of that policy. So when the older spouse dies, the policy automatically transfers into this trust. And usually it's a trust like a credit shelter trust or a bypass trust that many of you may be familiar with used um, typically at the death of um, an individual that funds, you know, all my exemption goes to my credit shelter trust. And anything that exceeds my exemption 
uh, that I have in assets goes to a marital trust. Okay, so we would take the policy and put it into that credit shelter trust at the death of the older spouse. Now the surviving spouse still has theoretically not access, but you know the trustee could make distributions of cash value to that um, spouse. I uh, could use other assets to help continue paying premiums if premiums are due, and we keep the policy out of the surviving spouse's estate. And that's really the key with the standby trust is the policy is most valuable at the death of the survivor. That's when the death benefits are paid. That's what we don't want included in the estate. On the death of the older spouse, so the first spouse to die, the value of the policy is not gonna be the death benefit, it's gonna be whatever the value of the policy is with the, an insured still alive. And that's typically the interpolated terminal reserve value, uh, which is often much, much, much less uh, than the actual death benefit. So that would be the play here is, uh, for a little bit of estate tax inclusion uh, equal to the value of that policy at the first spouse's death, they get to control and keep full flexibility and ownership over the policy until the death of the first spouse. So that's another opportunity, a different opportunity to think about with respect particularly to survivorship policies. What now? Interest rates. So we can't talk about flexibility and we can't talk about uncertainty without talking about the current low interest rate environment and what we do with those interest rates. So as Kathy mentioned at the top of our, our session, uh, interest rates have never ever been lower. And I don't have September rates on this screen because uh, I just did not get a chance yet to update this slide. But I will tell you, if you have a pen and a piece of paper and you wanna write these down, uh, the short-term rate, those are loans between zero and three years, is 0.14% for September, okay? Last time we saw a lower rate, with, oh no, that's the lowest rate we, it's ever been. I think back in 2011, we saw 0.16% rate. So this is the lowest ever, 0.14. The midterm rate is 0.35% for September. The long-term rate, those are going to be loans that exceed nine years. That's 1%, 1.0%. Uh, we're effectively giving money away here. We're barely charging anything. And that 75-20 rate, which we used for um, interest like a grant or retained annuity trust in CLATS to determine effectively what we have to pay out as an annuity interest, uh, that is still 0.40% for September. So same as August. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why these rates matter. And again, this comes down to flexibility. And I'm gonna talk about in, particularly, in particular, one opportunity that I think brings together all the things that we have mentioned previously on this call. So the uncertainty, the need for flexibility, the fact that we know that clients may need to make very large gifts very soon, depending on what happens either in November or again, uh, what comes down the pipeline in terms of uh, tax proposals or legislation. So here, this is an opportunity to use private financing to start a loan, uh, but create flexibility to make a gift at any time. And this is why we're calling this opportunity a wait and see loan. So with private financing, the grantor of the trust is gonna be their, their own bank. Instead of going to a commercial bank, they are gonna go out and lend their own money to the trust for one of these very low interest rates. And so um, we'll go through an example on the next page, but in return for making a large loan to the trust, the grantor takes back a promissory note and that charges the applicable interest rate. So whatever interest rate uh, makes sense based on the term of the note and the month that the loan is made. And then what the trust does is it used some or all of whatever was lent to the trust to pay premiums on a life insurance policy and potentially do some other things. And uh, then we'll receive the death benefit. And at some point in time, the trust will repay the grantor. Sometimes that can happen during life. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how that can work. Sometimes those debts may last for the rest of the grantor's life and the trust will use some of the insurance proceeds to actually pay back the estate, which happens to also infuse the estate with some cash. So it, it's, not, it, it, it's not a bad deal. Uh, to do it at uh, repay it at death either. Okay, so let me walk you through an example of how this wait and see design works. And I think I'm a visual person, so I like to see the numbers uh, and it makes more sense to me. So hopefully it will to you as well. So in this example, we're assuming we have a male client age 55 
who is going to um, make a loan worth about $5 million to his islet using a 15 year term note, okay? Again, any, any loan after 10 years is, or after nine years is gonna get the long-term AFR rate. Uh, so we've designed this to be a 15 year term, but once you get and you lock in the long-term rate, my point of view is a little bit like, why not just leave the loan outstanding for the rest of my life? You know, don't require any payment. Um, and for some clients, that's going to work great. Some clients may want to know, no, I, I, I need to know that I'm going to get my money back at a certain time in the future, in which case setting it at a 15-year term loan would be fine. So the AFR we're assuming here is 1.15% because this was the May 2020 AFR rate. Again, the current rate in September is going to be 15 basis points underneath that, which can make actually quite a significant difference when you look at the numbers. With this lump sum loan, $5 million, we're gonna assume that the asset is gonna be invested inside the trust and the income generated off that $5 million is predicted to be about 15, 5% for the next, you know, every year for 15 years. I understand that it's hard to guarantee, almost impossible, that you're gonna get that 5% return. There's some flexibility too that, you know, you can work with, so if you don't get the right return, it doesn't um, demolish or, or deplete the, the benefits of this planning technique. But for our assumption, we're gonna assume 5%. The trust is gonna purchase about a $13 million protection index universal life policy on the grantor's life. And we're mirroring the premium payments to the term. So we're doing 15 year term, we're gonna do a 15 year premium payment. So at the end of the term, uh, there's no more premiums to pay going forward. And then with that 5% asset return, we're gonna do two different things. We're going to use a portion of it to pay the premium on the life insurance policy. And then we're also gonna use it to cover the interest back to the grantor uh, every year. And one of the reasons I like if I can do it to show interest being paid to the grantor is that typically these arrangements are done between a grantor and the trust, which is designed as a defective grantor trust which means that the grantor still has to pay all the income taxes on the income being derived inside the trust. So to be able to pay the grantor something every year to help cover that tax liabilities, uh, usually clients are not uh, in objection to that. They like that. So here's how it's gonna work in terms of flexibility. So we make the loan to the, the trust. You can see the interest being paid back to the grantor at the 1.15% in the green. You can see the trust income uh, in the middle of your screen at about 200 and almost $241,000. So again, we're paying the premium of 183, we're paying the interest of 57. Uh, so effectively, we're keeping our side fund flat at about $5 million. We're not depleting the, the principal, but we're also not really growing it because we're spending all the income. Uh, if we get to a point where the client it could be two months after this is initiated. It could be two years. It could be at the end of 2025 when the tax law changes are set, set under current law to expire. This client may say, you know what? I want to make a gift. I need that $5 million that I lent to be a gift. What do I do? And your response is, you rip up the promissory note, tell your attorney, and the gift has been made. So what have you done? You've gotten the planning in place today. You move forward, you've gotten the islet funded, you've moved the money. You also are getting the appreciation out of the estate and using that to pay the, the premiums. And you've made it really, really simple for at the very last minute possible for the client to decide to make the gift if they wanna make a gift, okay? So real flexibility there with the wait and see. I'm gonna start as a loan and I'm wait and see if I wanna make a gift. Let's say the client though decides not to make this a gift. Maybe they use their gifting for something else or the tax laws never change and they never have to worry about, you know, um, using up this exemption. In that case, well, we have an ex exit strategy that we built into the plan. Because if you remember, we're really not spending down any of the principal. What we're doing is spending the, the trust income or the income generated. So after 15 years of premium payments, which is what we use for our illustration, Really, there's no reason that the trust needs to hold on to the $5 million. And in fact, we've gotten to the end of the trust term, which is 15 years. So now the trustee really just repays the $5 million. There's no accrued interest and the client gets their asset back. So 
we, and we did no gifting, none, um, theoretically. So I think that's a huge opportunity too, just not only start a strategy that offers this, this, um, ability to quickly forgive the debt should we need to to be able to get in the exemption before the last minute uh, before it expires but we've also now created an exit strategy that we all talk about with financing strategies is so important we baked in the exit strategy into this plan so that's how that wait and see loan works additional opportunities in the estate planning environment that leverage these low interest rates I mentioned premium uh, private financing loans uh, we talked about the wait and see loans, also opportunities beyond wait and see loans or just general private financing loans. Also think about the ability for uh, if you're working with either maybe a senior generation who has done all their planning, bought all their life insurance, but now are helping the next generation purchase life insurance and they need some help funding, you could use senior generation wealth to help fund second or third generation policies uh, owned inside trust. So that's an opportunity as well. Sales is effective trust, I mentioned, not only because of the discounting, but the low interest rate. So we'd be looking at family businesses, LLCs, FLPs, real estate interests. Uh, grants, grant or retained annuity trust, huge opportunity. Um, generally, we do zeroed out grants in estate planning, which means that when we fund the grant and take back a large annuity interest, uh, although there is a remainder that passes on to typically the kids, um, there is no real gift tax impact in doing a grant, um, assuming the grantor survives the grant term. Uh, so huge opportunity just to move wealth with using very little to no gift tax exemption. But we also combine grants oftentimes as an exit strategy for other pl estate planning techniques. So for example, worked on a lot of cases recently where we've done private split dollar transactions. So again, maybe I'm working with a survivorship policy or a young insured, and we're starting the transaction with um, the client paying the premiums on a private split dollar basis. Uh, but after the premium payments are done, we need a way to roll out of that strategy because as I mentioned, if you're using economic benefit rates, those rates go get much higher when you get older or you have a death of the first insured. So a grant would be a great exit strategy to compare or to combine with a private split dollar approach or other approaches. Clats are similar to grants, but they uh, are designed for clients who are more charitably inclined, and that's where you would use that. Um, also, don't overlook the ability to use business dollars to do personal estate planning. So for many business owners, uh, especially C corporation owners, their C corporation is being taxed at a 21%. They're probably being taxed more like a 37% tax bracket. So there's opportunity to use the business dollars to fund the personal estate planning needs and not have to distribute that money out or use the client's um, own money to do so. Uh, again, keeping in mind, you always want you know some type of exit strategy to repay the business. I'm also seeing um, sort of taking the estate planning hat off for a second opportunities for business owners who are actually looking to do some executive benefit planning uh, for key employees, especially businesses that, you know, have done well during during the pandemic, but they also see that they have really quality, important workers who are with them that are working around the clock. And, you know, they want to do something to reward them for that hard work and, and, and keep them around. So split dollar loans would be a great opportunity uh, in that market. And then finally, AFR rates are not the only low interest rates in this economy. We know that market interest rates, commercial interest rates are also very, very low at this time. So premium financing opportunities absolutely exist uh, for, the right, for the right client profile uh, to be able to essentially leverage the bank dollars to purchase significant life insurance and be able to keep their assets and potentially a higher earning um, assets that they might have in their estate rather than redirecting that towards premium payments. So all considerations or concepts to keep in mind. Finally, how to engage clients. You know, I think it's probably clear that given, you know, the, the type of examples and the wealth we've been talking about, that these are techniques typically engineered or more suited to high net worth affluent clients. Um, because we covered so much today, I would tell you, you know, there's a broad range of clients is those who are sitting on exemption uh, and haven't used it. Uh, people with estates over, you know, $10 million or so. Uh, estates or clients who maybe are not 
in a, a taxable position today, but could be in a taxable position if we saw a reduction of the exemptions. There are certainly people to think about just approaching and talking about particularly maybe the interest rate opportunities there. And then clients who maybe have little to no exemption available um, or, or already exhausted, you know, a financing technique could work really well for that because it creates a lot of efficiency. So assets to look for, you know, always trying to think about what are the assets my clients have and what are the best techniques that work with those assets. If you're doing outright gifting, basically all assets are on the table other than qualified plans like IRAs. Um, you know, that's, you can kind of pick it, although you do want to think about basis, because when you gift an asset out of the estate, uh, you don't get a basis step up on that asset in trust. That's also a great thing to point out to clients who have done gifting already, or are a little bit concerned about that, and tying together why life insurance makes sense to be owned inside the trust. So we talk about the benefits of the life insurance, not only for liquidity purposes, to pay estate taxes or other liabilities. You could also use life insurance to basically provide um, the, the, the resources to, to, to pay off the income taxes that can be associated with having a basis in assets that don't get a step up in basis at death. So something to keep in mind. Private financing, we're generally looking for clients with liquidity, maybe, Securities would work there without having to do a seed gift. Um, if they have hard assets, business business assets, um, income producing assets, real estate, you know, that's when we're looking at doing sales of assets through the effective trust, but those typically do require a seed gift in most instances or some type of beneficiary guarantee. Uh, grass and class, uh, again, a lot of different uh, assets work for that. What you really want is highly appreciating property because uh, the annuity interest is based on that 75-20 rate, which I mentioned was 40 basis points. So if you have assets that can appreciate beyond that 40 basis points and hopefully well exceed that 40 basis points, then you're going to have a really healthy remainder that can pass on uh, to a trust to benefit the kids uh, without using much, if any, uh, gift tax exemption. And then finally, you know, we've been probably really diligent to to try to go back and look at the cases that we've worked on, even in the last six months, probably the last year, and say, you know, what cases didn't move forward? Which clients objected to making a gift? Can I talk to them now about the urgency or to think about the urgency and using up their exemption now? I know a lot of attorneys and CPAs are doing that very thing. They're going to the clients and making the pitch or the push to uh, do gifting. So if your client's getting those calls, you know, you want to be in on those conversations to help the client decide how they're going to invest that money once inside into the trust. If they're objecting to making the gifts because of flexibility, talk about the slats and the survivorship standby trust. Think about how you can add additional flexibility to overcome those objections. And then finally, you know, think about where financing makes a difference and makes sense and could create efficiencies, not only for clients who are hesitant to use their gift tax exemption, but also there are a lot of clients out there. I worked on a case yesterday where, uh, Clients are worth 400 million. They have some survivorship owned outside the estate. The premiums, I think in total that they were paying was about $250,000. And these clients were just writing checks, which is great. No issue with that whatsoever. We don't want to tell clients not to write a check, uh, but they are eating up a decent amount of their exemption, which again could be reduced in the future. And there are more efficient ways for them to be able to pay those insurance. They'll still have to write the $250 check but we could do a private split dollar or a private financing or another technique that won't eat up their exemption so that they can actually use their exemption for additional other planning. So that's the type, I think, of resources that we can really help inform and provide clients um, and great opportunity just to check in with your high net worth clients just because, you know, they're probably not keeping track of AFR rates the same way that we are. And uh, I think there's a lot to be said uh, and start a lot of good conversations, maybe even uncover additional insurance opportunities for them. So that is essentially my pitch to you today uh, about why this is a really great time uh, in estate planning. I think you can probably see I, I, I'm a little giddy because it really is unprecedented, the amount of opportunities that we can offer to clients today. Makes me want to go back to practice and, uh, and, and get in with clients directly, but I'll stay here for right now. 
Caroline, uh, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of our audience and Agency One. If you've got any, that, it was, that was amazing. Uh, if you've got any questions, please type them into the question box. We do have one uh, that came in during your presentation. And that question is, instead of structuring the loan to an islet, can the loan be made to a slat? Oh, absolutely. So uh, that's a really great question, and I, I'm sorry, I know it can be confusing. So typically, a slat is an islet. So the islet is the irrevocable trust that is designed to own life insurance. It maybe only owns life insurance or is designed to own multiple types of assets beyond life insurance. And we can take any islet, or when we're drafting islets, we can make any islet a slat. So a slat is an islet. Um, not all islets are slats, if that makes sense. Um, terrific. I think we have another, uh, I thought we had another question. I saw a hand raised um, from Mr. Churchill, but I don't see a question. So uh, Lee, if you can hear me, feel free to type a question in and uh, we'll try and address it. The slides are going to be available on our website. The recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel. Again, if anybody has any questions or comments, um, we would love to hear from you. Caroline, you went over a ton of information, and I think the uh, you know the bottom line is there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that advisors should be discussing with their clients regarding gifting opportunities and opportunities. Uh, that are in the marketplace to take advantage of this low interest rate environment. One of the things that we do know is you've uh, so succinctly presented is that estate planning attorneys are talking about these opportunities right now with their clients. And now is the time for the financial advisor to uh, get in front of their clients as well to reinforce that these opportunities do exist. We're coming into the fourth quarter as Dennis Bartos, our partner in underwriting says, underwriting is most friendly in the fourth quarter. So this is the time to really go through your book, to go back and talk to your clients, anybody that's been um, kind of taking a wait and see approach during COVID, uh, you know, underwriting is opening up and this is the time to get that planning in place done before year end. Uh, nobody knows what's gonna happen certainly in the beginning of November, uh, but we do know that changes are forthcoming. Uh, with that, I don't see any other questions. Carolyn, again, I want to thank you so much on behalf of Agency One for your knowledge, your friendship, your availability. Uh, if anybody thinks of any questions afterwards, please reach out to uh, any of your contacts at Agency One. We are happy to uh, help you. I also want to take this. Oh, we do have the question from Lee Churchill. Um, so, Mr. Thank you, Lee. And the question was, would you use a loan or economic split dollar for generational? Uh, would you use loan or economic split dollar for generational skipping private split dollar and why? For generational skipping. So I'm curious if we're sort of saying intergenerational or generation skipping and they're a little bit different, but um, I'll try to answer it. Um, if I'm thinking about using private split dollar, ensuring, you know, the lives of, let's say the, the, the clients who are paying for the, the premium, you know, the mom and dad, let's say it. If they're buying insurance on their own life. Um, you know, the, the private split dollar can absolutely work in a, in a, with a GST trust. Um, the economic benefit that is deemed paid effectively or gifted to the trust every year would need to be sheltered by both the gift tax exemption and the GST exemption. But again, those economic benefit costs are typically so low, not a problem, and we can make sure that that trust remains GST. If we're asking about using private split dollar in sort of an intergenerational play, which is where we're buying insurance on the kids, but mom and dad are funding the premiums, um, we have seen that the IRS is challenging some of those because of the discounts that people have reported when senior generation, you know, they're 90 or 100 years old. When they die, they try to report that the value of that split dollar receivable, private split dollar receivable, is almost nothing because 
there's usually still 30 or 40 years before those receivables will be paid because we've insured the life of the kids. Um, because of the attack that the IRS has mounted against private split dollar, economic benefit split dollar in that space, uh, we have seen a lot more interest in moving intergenerational designs to a loan regime technique. Um, there's just more case authority about taking discounts on promissory notes than there has ever been in the economic benefit approach. So hopefully I covered, either one of those covered the questions that we have. Uh, thank you, Caroline. If uh, Lee, if that did not answer your question, reach out to me after the uh, webinar and we'll be happy to take a deeper dive into the information that you're looking for. I do not see any other questions. I also want to take this time to thank Wayne Baldwin, our regional VP for John Hancock. Uh, Wayne provides a tremendous amount of support to Agency One and is instrumental in helping uh, provide information and also moving all of the John Hancock cases along as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, Wayne, I see you're joining us. If there's anything else that you would like to add, uh, please feel free to do so. Just a, a thank you to Agency One for you know the opportunity today and for everybody taking time out of a busy schedule to be on the call. And I hope you and your families are well in these unusual times. And thanks to those that have done business with us this year and those that haven't, what's up with that? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we're, we're interested in working with you. The one comment I do want to make is I, we at Hancock, but my territory in particular, have seen a lot of estate planning, estate distribution planning sales. I've had more sales opportunities been made in the last six months than I've seen in any other six month period, uh, believe it or not. And I think it's because of a lot of things that Caroline's been talking about, the low interest rates, they involve private financing, premium financing. And I think the other um, situation is, like we talked about, the attorneys are talking to their clients about it. So we need, personally speaking, to get in front of that as much as possible, get with those attorneys. And I think the other reason is, these people are more available. They're not traveling, they're more available, they're thinking about their estate, and they're more open to the conversation that we wanna have with them. So again, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Wayne. So by way of some housekeeping, uh, we are going to have our next Agency One webinar uh, after Labor Day. It's gonna be on Thursday, September 10th, and we are going to provide that ever popular underwriting update. We haven't had one in a while. And as I had mentioned, we are coming right into fourth quarter uh, and these are unusual times and we can get your cases done for you, but it's important that you understand what is available from an underwriting perspective and the best way uh, to help position your cases to get them placed before year end. So please look for the invitation that will be coming out uh, from our marketing department for that underwriting update. And of course, our friends at John Hancock will certainly be included in that. So again, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Wayne. If anybody at Agency One can help you, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to your case manager, to Gonzalo Garcia, or myself, or Ed Lesher, or Dennis Bartos. And uh, with that, we wish you a great week and hope everyone has a wonderful Labor Day holiday. Uh, but Agency One is open for business and um, we're here to answer any of your questions. So have a great afternoon. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.